Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the official party and remain standing for the national anthem sung by the Parkway Chorale and the invocation. About pace. Present Paul. Stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight. For the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. Then the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, came through through the night. Then our flag was still there. Oh, say. Ladies and gentlemen, Chaplain Robert K. Magaha, United States Navy, will provide the invocation. Let us pray. <clears throat> Eternal God, whose strength delivers those in peril, we are deeply grateful for the distinguished service and proud memories of the crew of Flight 60528. On the 50th anniversary of this sad event, we remember the courage and determination of those Air Force crew members who made the ultimate sacrifice to help keep our nation free. Make holy their sacrifices, not because we glorify war, but because we strive for peace. May America always honor the men and women who have faithfully served and who are currently serving in the armed forces. Your word, Heavenly Father, declares, blessed is a nation whose Lord is God. Today and always, may we trust in you and remain your faithful servants. To you, O oh God, the way, the truth, and the life, be all the honor and glory both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, Parkway Corral, and thank you, Chaplain Magaha. At this time, please see, take your seats, please. At this time, I would like to introduce Colonel John D. Stauffer, United States Air Force, Commander, 70th Intel Wing. What a glorious, glorious day to do this. Good morning, Mr. Inglis, Brigadier General Jones, and most importantly, the loved ones, family, and friends of those lost aboard tail number 60528 on that fateful day in September of 1958. A special welcome to our veterans in attendance here today and the members of the Prop Wash Gang. It's great to see you here. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge our formation of 70th Intel Wing Airmen standing so proudly in honor of this occasion. To Deputy, Deputy Director of NSA, Mr. Inglis, sir, uh, you agreeing to speak today is truly fitting, not only in your current capacity as Deputy Director, but as an airman in your own right. I'm also speaking today on behalf of the men and women of the 70th, 70th Intelligence Wing, on behalf of the Air Force ISR Agency and on behalf of the United States Air Force as a whole. This, this has been an annual event for the 70th and it's not only an opportunity to pay tribute to these brave airmen but also to ensure we never forget. This year we asked NSA to help us host this ceremony honoring the 50th anniversary of the loss of our fellow cryptologic airmen. The date September 2nd memorializes an important point in the Air Force cryptologic history an important point in NSA's airborne cryptologic program 
And it also highlights the important legacy of teamwork and partnership between NSA and the military services. For the past 50 years, we've seen the evolution of airborne intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance from the skies behind the Iron Curtain to Southeast Asia, South America, and now the Middle East. Airborne cryptologists have flown silent in the night, monitoring our enemies from a vantage point often well inside harm's way. For the Air Force veterans here today, you have lived through considerable name changes and organizational restructure. But for us airmen, it really all started with the U.S. Air Force Security Service, then the Electronic Security Command, Air Force Intelligence Command, Air Intelligence Agency, and our recent transformation to the Air Force Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Agency. Air Force veterans have flown on C-130s and RC-135s and other platforms that are still in the fight in the global war on terror today. Today we are executing ground station operations, showing how early missions like Recce 60528 have evolved into a global network of sophisticated weapon systems. Some things, however, have not changed, and that is the commitment of men and women like the ones in formation here today who, when called upon, take on dangerous missions, fly over skies or on the ground and raise their hand and say, send me. To the family and, f and friends of those lost on the C-130 tail 60528, thank you from a grateful nation. Mr. Inglis, General Jones, and Command Sergeant Major Roper, thank you for helping us honor these brave airmen, and thank you for helping honor our Air Force heritage. God bless those who could not be with us here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel Stauffer. And welcome to the distinguished guests, retired members of the National Security Agency Central Security Service, the Prop Wash Gang. You're looking great this morning. And an especially warm welcome to the family members of the crew of 60528 with us here today. We gather today, of course, to pay tribute to a sacrifice made by the 17 airmen of aircraft 60528 exactly 50 years ago. Many of those now present we're here on September 2nd, 1997, when the, first, when the site was first dedicated. Since that time, we've added several additional memorials commemorating the service and sacrifice of the crews of 18 reconnaissance aircraft lost in harm's way, 12 Air Force, 4 Navy, 2 Army. The crew of 60528 faced a world not unlike our own. While the technical and social innovations of the American space program, personal computers, the all-volunteer military, telecommunications marvels, and the internet lay years in the future, they were in their day keenly aware of the enduring challenges faced by those who would build a world based on the right of self-determination and the love of liberty. They, like so many before them, knew and embraced the duty borne by the present generation to sustain and build upon those of the past in a world that was as dangerous as it was unpredictable. In the world known by the crew of 60528, Soviet militaries controlled bordering states as their far-flung empire had an iron grip, cracking down forcibly when needed, as recently as two years before in Hungary. North Korea remained at war with the United Nations, across a demilitarized zone that enjoyed a fragile truce backed by massive military forces on both sides. The launch of the Soviet Sputnik, Sputnik satellite in the fall of 1957, just 10 months prior, and the continued challenges experienced by its U.S. counterpart program added further angst to a nation already challenged by provocation across Soviet military, economic, and social initiatives. From the vantage point of September 1958, victory in the Cold War was by no means seen as either imminent or certain. And while much credit would be rightly given 25 years later to President Reagan for forcing the reconciliation of the Soviet system with its Western counterparts, the seeds of that victory were sown long before. Institutions like the World Bank, created in the late 1940s, combined with economic initiatives like the Marshall Plan and the U.S. Agency for International Development to create an economic fabric to support emerging democracies. NATO and its Asian counterpart gave rise to a stronger military coalition committed to collective security. But key among the institutions created in the late 1940s and the 1950s were those whose charge was to provide the intelligence necessary to determine Soviet plans, intentions, and capabilities, and to provide critical warning in the event of hostilities. 
The National Security Agency was formed in 1952, combining civilian and military predecessor organizations into a single worldwide system charged with providing signals intelligence for decision makers from the president to the nation's military forces. If you'd stood on this spot in 1958 and looked to the southeast, you would have seen a low slung building housing the National Security Agency headquarters. It's there still, but hidden by construction that's been added and grown up around in the ensuing 50 years. The Baltimore Washington Parkway was here too, four years old in those days, but there would have been no sign indicating the presence of the National Security Agency just over the tree line. Such things weren't discussed, even within the families of those who served here. Many of you remember a time when NSA stood for no such agency. But more important than these institutions is that the fact that their great strength derives from the people who serve them. The crew of 60528 were a vital extension of that system. Their mission was to create a unique window along the border with the Soviet Union, providing insight into Soviet capabilities and intentions, and a tripwire against the possibility of military surprise. They were highly trained, and they were very good at what they did. Their day, some 50 years ago, would have begun with well-practiced routines, with each member across the air crew and the reconnaissance team in the back making a valuable contribution in a complex choreography of technical duties. From flying the airplane to manning its complex reconnaissance equipment, their duties required years of training and a passion for teamwork, belying a commitment to the welfare of the mission and the organization, the nation, over that of self. Their day began at Insulik Air Base, a Turkish base located just north of the northeast corner of the Mediterranean Sea. During my own time as a C-130 pilot, I had the opportunity many times to fly from that base. But even in my day, some 30 years plus after the shootdown of 60528, the area had a feeling of a place that was somewhere beyond the familiar horizon, astounding in its beauty and amazing in the history of its peoples, but unfamiliar in landscape and culture. Their loss on that unfamiliar landscape 50 years ago today was the first combat loss of a C-130 in a Cold War that was anything but cold. Their sacrifice will be followed by many others across a simmering conflict that never quite boiled over, but whose tensions were keenly felt at each and every edge of the borders between East and West. We remember those who gave their lives today as airmen, soldiers, and sailors. But we also remember them as beloved family members, fathers, brothers, sons, sisters, and daughters. Every one of them left behind a tear in the fabric of a family and community that bore and nurtured them. We owe a debt of thanks to the families for their sacrifice. Impossible to measure, but reflected in the great sorrow of loved ones missed and all the what might have beens that linger in the mind's eye to this day. I know the sorrow that my parents, my siblings, and I experienced at the death of my younger brother, Pat, when his A-6 fighter bomber crashed at the edge of a Soviet naval task force in the Mediterranean Sea some 25 years ago today. The hole will never be filled, but his contribution to the nation, like that of Crew 60528, across the years will always shine more brightly. And so it is with the crew of 60528 that we remember and honor today, 50 years after their untimely passing from this life. Their names are etched in our hearts and permanently scribed into the history of the security services that they serve so well. Paul Duncan, Edward Jarus, John Simpson, Rudy Suistra, Ricardo Villarreal, George Petrocolis, Arthur Mello, Leroy Price, Robert Oshinsiki, Archer Borg, James Ferguson, Joel Fields, Harold Kemps, Clement Mankins, Gerald Maggiacomo, Gerald Medeiros, and Robert Moore. Our charge is to remember them and to carry on their work across the families, the communities, the nation, that they in their time sustained and left as a legacy from them through us for the ages. I close with the words of poet Lawrence Binion, penned some nearly 100 years ago. They shall not grow old as we that are left to grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. I'd like now to introduce Brigadier General Tom Jones, the Deputy Chief of the Central Security Service, who will recount the service and sacrifice of the crew of 60528. General Jones. Thank you, Mr. English. 
The day often started way too early for the men of the 7406 support squadron. The morning of September 2nd, 1958 was no exception. By 3.30 a.m., the crew of Flight 60528 was in the dining hall, preparing for a long day of top secret work. Their mission was both dangerous and routine. Dangerous because they made their living flying perilously close to the USSR to gather critical intelligence. Routine because despite the danger, the brave men of the unit had performed these kinds of missions many, many times. By 1958, the conflict that Bernard Baruch had termed the Cold War was in full swing. After World War II, the Soviet Union, one of the critical partners in the Allied effort to defeat the Axis powers, had almost overnight become a dangerous adversary. To make things worse, the USSR was a closed society. This made it exceedingly difficult to obtain the critical information that U.S. leaders needed to understand the true capabilities of the Soviet threat. In order to meet the challenge of getting the vital intelligence needed during this time, the United States was required to conduct a wide variety of bold intelligence operations. Due to the unique nature of the conflict, it was not only military superiority, superiority that mattered, but political and diplomatic as well. In short, in our nation's efforts to defeat the USSR, information was power. One of the more valuable programs in this effort to obtain the critical data required to ascertain Soviet capabilities was the Aerial Reconnaissance Program. This effort required utilizing a wide variety of aircraft to skirt the borders of the USSR to gather both photographic and signals intelligence. The aircraft carried no weapons, and Soviet fighters often took every opportunity to shoot those planes from the skies. Under these conditions, the air crews and cryptologists needed to be not only competent, but also courageous. The permanent home of the 7406 was Rhine Main Air Base in Germany, but due to operational necessity, the group also performed temporary missions out of Inslik Air Base in Turkey. The plan that day was for the group's C-130 to depart from Inslik and fly a racetrack pattern between Van and Trabzon, Turkey. At no time was the plane supposed to be closer than 100 miles to Soviet airspace. The crew that would man flight 60528, like so many military units, was a cross-section of the nation for which it fought. Some members, such as Master Sergeant George Petrokolis, had served with distinction in World War II. Others, such as Airman Archie Borg and Airman Moore, were just starting their military careers and had spent far less time off in the wild blue. Flight 60528 left the runway at 11.21 Inserlik time and at 12.42, the co-pilot, Captain John Simpson, radioed Ankara Control to inform them that the plane had reached Trabzon. That transmission would be the last word heard from the flight. What happened next will forever remain a mystery. It is possible that the air crew, because Soviet navigational beacons in Armenia and Georgia were on similar frequencies to those in Trabzon and Van, had become confused. What is known is that shortly after 1 p.m., the aircraft crossed the Soviet border and was attacked by a squadron of Soviet MiGs from the 236th Fighter Air Division. To quote Larry Tart, the author of the novel The Price of Vigilance, without even time for a mayday call, 17 men, the majority of them in their late teen or early 20s, were blasted out of the sky. At the time of the incident, Soviet authorities denied any involvement in the shootdown. Even when President Eisenhower, in an unprecedented move, released the intercepted conversations of the Soviet pilots, the leaders of the USSR refused to take any responsibility for the attack. It would not be until decades later, during the tenure of Boris Yeltsin, that declassified Soviet documents would finally make it clear that all crew members had perished during the crash. In the post-Cold War period, it is common for individuals to perceive the former Soviet Union as a lumbering nation-state that contained the seeds of its own destruction. History demonstrates, however, that the free world's triumph over the specter of worldwide communism did not come easily. It is instructive to remember that while the Cold War was indeed a victory for the United States and our allies, it was a conflict that for the most part was not won on the battlefield. Instead, victory was secured by the countless groups of dedicated men and women who took it upon themselves, sometimes at the cost of their own lives, to get information that our nation's policymakers and warfighters needed to not only prepare for war, 
but more importantly, to keep the peace. With this in mind, today we honor and treasure the service and sacrifice of the members of Flight 60528. I'll close this morning with a poem from the author William Keats. I know that I shall meet my fate somewhere among the clouds above. I balanced all, brought all to mind. The years to come seemed waste of breath, a waste of breath the years behind in balance with this life, this death. Thank you, Brigadier General Jones. Would everyone please stand and remain standing for the wreathling ceremony? Present. Order. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's ceremony. Please join the family and friends to recognize these fallen heroes, these American airmen. There will be a hospitality tent for distinguished visitors and for family members. Thank you.